blood or blood components for the women. Close collaboration between the maternity, neonatology, and hematology staff is essential. When blood is required for women with multiple antibodies or antibodies against high-prevalence antigens, planning is required as rare blood donors may need to be called up to donate or frozen blood may need to be obtained from the National Frozen Blood Bank in Liverpool. Local blood transport time and time for cross-match should be taken into account when the decision for transfusion is made. Blood for intrauterine transfusion or IUT. Clinicians should be aware that blood for IUT has the same requirements as blood for neonatal exchange, except that plasma is removed by the blood center to increase the hematocrit to 0.70 to 0.85 and it is always irradiated. Blood for neonatal exchange. Blood should be ABO compatible with the neonate and mother to avoid ABO HDFN from the women's anti A or B antibodies present. RHD negative or RHD identical with the neonate. K negative, negative for the corresponding antigen to which the woman has an antibody and cross-match compatible with the women's blood sample. Blood should be less than 5 days old to ensure low supernatan potassium levels, CMV or cytomegalovirus negative, and irradiated unless the risk to the baby of delaying exchange transfusion while obtaining irradiated blood at waist is. It should be plasma-reduced rather than in saline adenine glucose mannitol or SAGM additive solution with a hematocrit of 0.50 to 0.60. Once irradiated, exchange blood has a shelf life of 24 hours. Blood should be cytomegalovirus negative to minimize the risk of cytomegalovirus infection in the neonate and irradiated to prevent transfusion-associated graft-versus-host disease due to the large volume of blood transfused to a neonate. Plasma-reduced blood is preferable as blood suspended in the saline adenine glucose mannitol or SAGM contains glucose which can result in rebound hypoglycemia and mannitol with potential diuretic and intracerebral pressure effects. The recommended hematocrit allows for sufficient correction of anemia after exchange but without an unacceptably high hematocrit with its associated risk to the neonate. Blood for neonatal small volume or top-up transfusion. Blood should be ABO compatible with the neonate and mother to avoid ABO HDFN from the women's anti-A or anti-B antibodies present RHD negative or RHD identical with neonate, K negative, and negative for the corresponding antigen to which the woman has an antibody and cross-match compatible with the woman's blood sample. Blood should be CMV or cytomegalovirus negative but does not need to be irradiated unless the neonate has had a previous intrauterine transfusion and blood can be stored in SAGM rather than plasma-reduced and be up to 35 days old as a top-up transfusion is a much smaller volume than an exchange transfusion. Clinicians considering transfusion in a neonate must check if the baby has had an intrauterine transfusion or IUT as if so, blood must be irradiated to prevent transfusion-associated graft versus host disease. While blood for IUT or intrauterine transfusion should be irradiated because of the physiological immune incompetence of the fetus, allowing transfusion-induced tolerance or immunosuppression for top-up, small-volume, neonatal transfusions in the absence of any preceding IUT, Irradiation is not required. If ABO negative, 
RHD negative and K negative compatible blood that is not matched for other antibodies is used for resuscitation in the event of life threatening hemorrhage. Consider giving intravenous methylprednisolone 1 gram and monitor the woman closely. If a severe transfusion reaction develops, full resuscitative measures, including the use of adrenaline, may be required. The presence of maternal red cell antibodies has no implications for other blood components such as platelets, fresh frozen plasma, cryoprecipitate, or fractionated products. What blood or blood components can be administered in the emergency situation to a woman known to have red cell antibodies? The decision to use ABO negative, RHD negative, and K negative compatible blood that is not matched for other antibodies or O negative, where the women's ABO and RHD groups are unknown, should be made on the balance of risk, severe hemorrhage versus a hemolytic transfusion reaction. Transfusion should not be delayed in the event of life-threatening hemorrhage. Close liaison with a transfusion laboratory is essential. Birth. What is the optimum mode? place, and timing of birth. Timing of delivery for women with red cell antibodies that can cause fetal anemia will depend on the antibody levels or titers, rate of rise, as well as if any fetal therapy has been required. The mode, timing, and place of delivery are otherwise dependent on standard obstetric grounds. If a woman is at risk of requiring significant amounts of transfused blood, either antenatally, intrapartum, or postnatally, consideration should be given to transferring her care to a center capable of processing cross-match samples and providing appropriate compatible blood rapidly. As these are high-risk pregnancies, continuous electronic fetal heart monitoring is advised during labor. In general, for red cell antibodies that could cause fetal anemia, but which have been stable throughout pregnancy, delivery should take place between 37 and 38 weeks of gestation. If an intrauterine transfusion or IUT has not been required, but antibody levels are rising, then consideration for earlier delivery may be necessary. If an intrauterine transfusion or IUT has been required, Delivery will need to be timed to ensure that the fetus is not significantly anemic at birth. This will depend on the gestation that the last IUT was performed as well as the estimated rate of drop of fetal hemoglobin or hematocrit. Decisions about the timing of delivery are most appropriately made by the fetal medicine team managing these pregnancies. Prior IUT is not in itself an indication for elective cesarean section. The neonatal team should be advised of the timing of delivery in the event that further neonatal care is required. Cord blood investigations. What cord blood investigations should be performed? If a woman has clinically significant antibodies, then cord samples should be taken for a direct antiglobulin test or DIT hemoglobin, and bilirubin levels. A positive DAT or direct antiglobulin test indicates that the infant's red cells are coated with antibody but in itself cannot predict severity of hemolysis. Notably, the DAT may be negative in ABO HDFN or ABO hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn. It is therefore essential to also determine hemoglobin and bilirubin levels to ascertain the degree of anemia and hemolysis at birth, and this helps guide management as below. Management How should the neonate be managed? This depends on the risk of hemolysis or anemia conferred by the relevant red cell antibody. The neonate should have regular clinical assessment of its neurobehavioral state and be observed for the development of jaundice and or anemia.
regular assessment of bilirubin and hemoglobin levels should be made and early discharge is not advisable. The mother should be encouraged to feed the baby regularly to guard against dehydration since dehydration can increase the severity of jaundice. Clinicians should be aware that if bilirubin levels rise rapidly or above the interventional threshold, phototherapy and or exchange transfusion may be required. Pregnancy is complicated by red cell alloimmunization with a minimal or no risk of fetal or neonatal anemia require no specific treatment. Exchange transfusion may be used to manage severe anemia at birth and to treat severe hypobilirubinemia. Such a transfusion is undertaken with the aims of removing both the antibody-coated red cells and the excess bilirubin. Future risk. What is the risk of recurrence in a future pregnancy? A woman with a history of a pregnancy or infant affected by HDFN should be referred for early assessment to a fetal medicine specialist in all further pregnancies. The risk of recurrence of hemolytic disease of the fetus and newborn or HDFN depends on the type of antibody, the paternal genotype, as well as the severity and gestational onset of the fetal anemia. Long-term consequences of red cell antibodies to women and their offspring. What are the long-term health consequences for the women? Women can be advised that there are no long-term adverse health consequences associated with the presence of red cell antibodies. What are the long-term health concerns for the children of women with red cell antibodies during pregnancy? Clinicians should be aware that some infants may experience anemia persisting for a few weeks following birth. Clinicians should be aware that some infants may develop late anemia, which is usually due to hyporegenerative anemia. Anemia persisting for a few weeks after birth is usually the result of passively acquired maternal antibodies causing continued hemolysis. Late anemia may develop due to a transient suppression of neonatal erythropoiesis, itself due to transfusion. Babies who have required several intrauterine transfusions, or IUTs, are at particular risk. Affected infants have suppression of erythropoiesis with low numbers of reticulocytes, despite a low packed cell volume and normal erythropoietin values. Top-up transfusions are required only if the infant is symptomatic. There is some evidence that the need and frequency of top-up transfusions may be decreased if recombinant erythropoietin is used. Sensory neural hearing loss is more common in infants affected by hemolytic disease of the newborn because of the toxic effect of prolonged exposure of bilirubin on the developing 8th cranial nerve. 